us together again this um, afternoon going into evening. Amen. Before we start, could we please request um, Brother Lucky to please open for us in prayer. Could we please mute ourselves? I see that some people that are unmuted, please mute yourselves. Um, and Brother Lucky, please pray for us. Open for us in prayer. All right, um, let us pray. Our Father is in heaven, we thank you, loving God, for gathering us this afternoon to listen to your word, uh, to be encouraged and to be strengthened, O oh Lord, in our Christian walk and journey with you. Heavenly Father, please be with the speakers. Please be with each and every person who will be joining in, O Lord. May your word fall on fertile soil, O Father, and may we be ready to receive it. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, um, Brother Lucky, for the prayer. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone again to this program. Once again, my name is Poholun Dombela, and this program is brought to you by Family Life Department of um, Tesda Church. So tonight, or this evening, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> we're going to be talking about sex and sexuality. Um, this has always been a topic that whenever it's addressed in church, we are always told not to do it, or it's, it's, it's addressed to single people being told not to do it, to wait for marriage, but nothing ever beyond that, that, okay, the only thing that we hear about sex when we are at church is that we should not do it, and then that's that. So we're really looking forward to tonight's presentation um, and to hear what um, the pastor has to say, has in store for us tonight. And I'm really praying, but no, I trust him that he will not be telling us not to have it because some of us are already married, so we're already having it. So we would like to hear from sex as much as we want to discuss the, the, the positive aspect of the negative aspect of it, but to also have a positive aspect of sex and sexuality. So over to you, Dr. Kingsley Moyo. Thank you once again for honoring us. Okay, I forgot one last thing. Um, could we please ensure that uh, any, if anybody has a question, you're welcome to put it in the chats. If you have a comment, you're welcome to put it in the, in the chats as well. Um, if you have a question, but you're shy and you feel like you don't want everybody to see it, you are welcome to inbox me or inbox um, a, 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 Pastor Moyo, you're welcome to inbox him as well. But of course, if you're brave, you can just let me know that um, you would like to raise, uh, you would like to ask a question. So obviously we'll have that question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So we'll start with the presentation first and then move on into the questions and answers segment. So don't forget if you have any questions, be sure to ask, don't feel too shy. Um, we really want everybody to be free and to, to have the, to, we are trying to create that safe space that we were talking about yesterday, you know, a space where you will not feel judged, a space where you know that um, your questions are legitimate and they are welcome. So please feel free. So I think, yeah, now we'll hand it over to uh, Pastor Moy. Good. Uh, I must say it. good morning because it's still morning for me. Uh, thank you, Wokolo, for setting us up for a fiery topic uh, uh, for us to be talking about. Um, I will normalize the topic as much as I can. Uh, uh, and also, I will be mentioning some things that if you have concerns for PG rated stuff and you are at a place whereby you feel like maybe you cannot necessarily have anyone here, I would suggest put some headphones on uh, or move away to a place where you will be able to go ahead and uh, uh, listen, ask questions and speak candidly. 
Um, so uh, that's one thing I just needed to mention to you. Um, other than that, let's 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 get into it. I hope you've been doing well. You are well rested, preparing for the uh, coming week. I know on my end, I am doing the same. It's still early morning. Um, the week is almost coming ahead. All right, let's 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 get into our discussion for today. Okay, we, we've already uh, uh, prayed. Uh, today I will endeavor to, to take on a, um, a teaching mode. Uh, preaching gets the better part of me, so I tend to preach, but I'll teach. Uh, and, then, um, and then from there, kind of have a conversation around the topic that we are delving into today. So we're talking about sex and sexuality, the unspoken. Uh, I know... Uh, we talk about it behind doors. We talk about it with our friends. In fact, some of the jokes that get circulated the most are the jokes that have to do with sex. So it's a topic that is not foreign to many of us. Uh, we love it. I love sex. Um, so I think let's 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 get into it. Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, I was reading. Uh, I was reading up an article, and I I like reading stories just for the purposes of just getting to know history. And I came across a story by um, Frederick II. He was the, the Holy Emperor around the 13th century. He had this crazy idea. I don't know where he got the idea from, that he wanted to find out if children or babies, if they were born and they had no one to, uh, to nurture them and take care of them and they didn't have somebody to listen to, uh, what language they would speak. Um, he, was, he was adamant that they would speak Italian uh, or some strange thing like that. So he declared and pronounced uh, an experiment. He said that I'm going to ask uh, several babies that are born, uh, rather call it a controlled experiment, really. He was going to take um, several babies. He was going to divide them in half. Half of the babies were going to leave in the palace with him. They will have nurses attending to them. They will have nurses feeding them, holding them, touching them, and playing with them. And the other half was going to be put into a room, um, and they wouldn't have anybody to touch them. Really, they would just be fed um, and no touching, nothing. And then you put a second rule as if to uh, knowing that the nurses would feel touched and would want to be able to touch these babies, they'll be moved. So you put a second rule, he says that when you are in the room with the babies, no matter how much you feel compelled to touch them or to speak to the babies, do not. If you do, you will be killed. Okay, so the experiment was set up. Half of the kids living in the palace, they were being attended to by nurses, being fed and spoken to. And the other half was living in a different place not being spoken to, not being touched, not being petted or caressed, um, only just being fed. So the experiment went on for a while. Um, needless to say, I'm sure you're wondering what language did the babies that were not being touched uh, end up speaking? The babies that were not being touched, they died. And at, um, a, 20, a 20th century writer, recording the incident highlights the fact that these children died because they lacked touch. Really, the children wanted intimacy. They wanted to be felt. They wanted to be loved. They wanted to be hugged, petted, caressed, and to hear a voice and to hear and feel a heartbeat. And because of that, and because they didn't get that, they, they, they died. So, you will begin to realize from an early age, um, uh, intimacy is is really a part of um, is really a part of um, uh, what God created us to be. It is it is a need. It is essential, and much more so 
sex involves intimacy at the highest level. Uh, one, one researcher highlighted the fact that if an orgasm lasted more than 30 seconds, you would die. It is that powerful. The release uh, um, is that strong and that powerful. So essentially, it is the highest level of intimacy that one could experience. So let's, let's, let's talk about it. Um, interesting enough, um, in my years growing up, perhaps maybe even to looking back, maybe midway, halfway in my mid thirties. I think that's the first time if I try and look back, yeah, halfway maybe in my mid thirties, uh, uh, um, that's the first time I heard a sermon about sex on the pulpit where actually a pastor or a preacher stands up, gets up and he starts preaching purely about sex. It is such a, a taboo and, and hidden topic. We never really talk about it. And interestingly enough, the world has more comments about how the church treats and talks about sex than we do. I, I was reading something, uh, an article on, on, on Newsweek, uh, some, I think some British article. It says, the Bible is stern and judgmental on sex. It forbids prostitution, adultery, premarital sex for women, I don't know why they say it for women, but anyway, and homosexuality. It is an ancient text inapplicable in its particulars to the modern world. This is an accusation by the secular societies telling the church that, hey, y'all don't talk about sex. You forbid sex for premarital sex for women. You, it's an ancient text. You, uh, in essence, we, 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 we shun and shame sex. And really shame has become one of the things that has been prevalent in, in sex. I, I speak with a lot of uh, individuals and couples. Um, one thing that the church has done is on the pulpit, uh, uh, around in conversations, we tell young people, don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex. And those who actually hold on up until their marriage bed, and it's time to have sex, um, they almost have no idea what to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's foreign, um, there is shame around it. And even sometimes in couples that have been doing it, um, there's still the shame of stripping naked in front of your husband. There is this cloudedness of shame around this thing that God created. This thing that is good. So, so the current generation has access to the internet. And so we learn about sex from outside of the church. We learn about it from pornography. We learn about it from friends. We learn about it from all the many dysfunctional places. My premise this, this, this evening, uh, as we go along, as we answer questions, as we go about it, I wanna shift your thought process to considering this, this statement. Sex is a state of, being. It is a state of being in a marriage relationship, not an activity. Sex is not when one organ goes into another organ. No, um, there's other problems. I could tell you a little bit more about that. It is actually a state of being. Um, it is not an activity. More often, we have tagged sex as uh, um, uh, doing something. And interestingly enough, when I run seminars for couples on sex, I usually have couples sit down, face each other and look at each other and have them ask and ask them the question, um, what is sex? Never have I gotten two couples that define sex the same way. For men, it's something differently. For women, it's something differently. Um, one time I had a couple where I asked them that question and the husband started off um, talking about how his organ would go into uh, 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 his wife. And, um, and at the end of that, they would relax uh, and probably eat because they were hungry. And then the wife um, said something rather interesting. The wife uh, started describing it as a morning event that leads into the afternoon. And then in the evening, 
maybe they could just cuddle and not even have the penetration. And I could see the husband's mouth drop open. And I don't know if he wanted to say that. He said, oh, in a sense, he was he didn't kind, of, kind of quite believe and accept that, that you want to call that sex? That was, that was not necessarily what he had in mind. So um, as an activity, um, thinking about those who are married, I want you to go home uh, and ask each other, what is sex? And pay attention to each other's responses. And, uh, and, and, and maybe you can begin to redefine what sex is. Um, so that's our premise for this evening. Sex is a state of being. It's a state of being. It is not an activity. Uh, and then there's the other piece, um, sexuality. Because often when we talk about sex as a state of being in a marriage relationship, those who are not married immediately zone off. because Well, that has nothing to do with me. Um, I'm not married. Or maybe you are having premarital sex. Um, I have come to learn and accept that even though we are all teaching and we are all uh, in the belief that um, there's no sex before marriage, easily half, I dare say, of people in our congregational settings are engaged in premarital sex. But for the purpose of this morning, I will stay with the biblical premise that sex is only for in marriage. Um, and then there's the other piece of sexuality. Sexuality is the capacity to express yourself sexually. And this is psychologically, emotionally, uh, and physically. So this is a capacity to express yourself in those three areas uh, of activity and physical activity. So sexuality, so when you begin to look at it, sexuality encompasses every one of us. I was, um, uh, um, I was blown away. I was doing um, a sex therapy session and I usually ask questions around, um, uh, around masturbation. I ask questions around orgasm, around ask questions around what was your earliest, um, when did you hit puberty? Because it tells me a whole lot of things about your developmental stages. And so I had this young lady, um, she's 20, 24, 24-ish. And so I asked her the question just, and I asked that to understand their relationship with sex, uh, how they perceive it, how they understand it. And so I asked the question, how old were you uh, when you uh, hit your puberty? Well, she tells me, uh, I, was, I was 13. Okay, fair and fine. And then I asked her about orgasm. And she says, well, um, I first hit my orgasm when I was nine years old. Now, mind you, uh, this is the first time for me. I'm glad because I was wearing the mask and um, I'm glad. I hope I didn't say oh, loud enough, but it was a realization for me that sexuality has no age limit. And she was saying this not because she was engaged in, in, in sex. She said that while she was on a um, acrobatics rope, she was climbing up and down a rope and her legs were curled around the rope and the sensation on, a, uh, on her genital area, she had this powerful sensation and she felt something that she had never felt before. And she didn't even know what it was. Now, that could be argued on development that the organs have not yet developed. But for me, that was the first. And having seen and heard her, haven't heard her say that in front of me, it got me to understand that really sexuality is, is something beautiful that God created us to have and God created us to be. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying go and uh, climb ropes in order to have your, your fix or, or tell your kids to stop doing acrobatics. No, this is just an illustration of what I I discovered. So here's the thing. God created sex and sexuality. It is a normal feeling and desire that all human beings experience. Um, and certainly for this young girl as early as nine years old. Um, so it is something that is real. We've tend to delegate it to puberty and to say that, well, that's when the body has kind of developed a little bit more then it's bound to have all of this. But she hit puberty at 13, but she began to feel this at an earlier age. So let's talk about a little bit more understanding 
uh, sex before sex and sexuality before the fall. Um, we read about the deliberation in the book of Genesis where God says, let us make Genesis 26. God did in male and female. He created them. A familiar biblical text, a familiar Bible verse that we read. Um, I want you to pay attention to uh, I want you to pay attention to Sorry, I just need to plug in something here so that I'm connected to my Wi-Fi properly. Um, uh, where was I? That's the thing about sex. It will just blow your mind and confuse you and you lose track. Uh, yeah, so Genesis 1 verse 27. Um, God created man in his own image. So you'll notice that male and female are complementary subjects that make up God's image. Um, it is incomplete to say that one piece is the complete image of God. It is both sides, the two of them, that are complementary, that create the image of God. So it's not just a male or female, but both make up the image of God. And which brings about another side of things that, uh, uh, that, that sexual distinction between male and female is fundamental to what it means to be human. To be human is to live as a sexual person. So we can't just relegate to sex and sexuality, the idea and the whole premise to uh, a certain group of people because it is created, it is designed to be a complementary exercise between male and female. Certain parts are delegated to marriage. I will unpack that a little bit more and certainly in the questions that we will answer. And then, then God sees fit to introduce sex and sexuality to his image, meaning Adam and Eve, male and female. Then he says in Genesis 2, 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. I, I know I've heard so many problems around this idea of helper, helper being described in so many ways. It almost feels like the woman um, is the one who's supposed to provide, uh, who's someone who's supposed to be on the sidelines, being a helper uh, to uh, the man. And I've heard women say that um, jokingly, but I don't know if they realize what they're saying. They say the man is the head, the woman is the neck. I dictate when the herd tends. That is some problems in its own, but uh, I won't go there. Uh, it's a topic for another day. Um, so the helper is not someone who is subordinate or someone who helps a man achieve his goals. Rather, the helper in the Hebrew term is a relational term. Uh, it is not necessarily a activity term. It is a relational term describing a beneficial relationship, not a rank or position of inferiority. So they are at par equals. They are relationally joined. It is beneficial to the wife. It is beneficial to the husband. So when, it, uh, when Eve was being created, it was going to be in a beneficial relationship to her and a beneficial relationship to the man. Um, we could talk a little bit more about that where men want to go ahead and pursue certain things and want their wife to support them and get uh, all kinds of ideas. It is a beneficial relationship. Um, interesting enough, if you read in Isaiah and you read in Jeremiah, you will discover that God is called Israel's helper. And by no means is God called inferior. In fact, God is superior uh, in that particular context. And using the same Hebrew term, God is actually superior. So, but it is never a subordinate term. So you begin to understand that we need to shift this idea of subordinate or uh, towards the idea of being relational. So then God gets into the mode 
of creating. In Genesis um, 1, verse 27, he, he creates, uh, it, 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 Genesis 1 and just 22, it uses an idea of um, the same prophetic how we understand Daniel and Revelation where it repeats and enlarge, repeat and enlarge. It says something in, da in, in Daniel chapter two, it repeats it in, da in Daniel chapter seven, uh, it expands and adds more detail. We see that certainly in Revelation as well. Genesis one and two employ the same strategy in Genesis one and verse 27, it introduces us to the idea of creation. Then in Genesis two, it introduces us to the idea uh, of creation for Adam. And then later on in Genesis verse 22, we see the creation of women. Then Lord God said, um, made a woman. For he made, uh, somebody's on YouTube. Uh, and he brought her to the man. And so we have these two sides being created. And what I've discovered that in Genesis 2, verse 7, the creation of men and Genesis 2 verse 22, as if God was trying to bring about this idea of equality and parallelity, uh, the same number of Hebrew words used to talk about how God created men and the same number of words used in Genesis 22 are exactly equal. In other words, further emphasizing to the Hebrew reader and for us in the 21st century uh, that these are two equal individuals. And one of the fascinating things that I've discovered is that men was created, the woman was built. Uh, uh, if you are a man, you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, a man was created, it's, it's as if God went down and said, yeah, let's just put a nose and put some hands and all that stuff. And for the woman, it's, it's as if he, he, he took the rib and fashioned Eve. Certainly you can see how the woman is built. The skin of a man is, is, is tough and rigid, but the skin of a woman is a little bit soft. And even when she moves, how her hips move back and forth, it's as if God knew something. Uh, he, he, he fashioned women. Um, it's that part of creating the sexuality and the sensuality between these two complementary beings. God was intentional, y'all, about this idea of sex and sexuality in Genesis. I don't know if you've read, read your Bible through those lenses of seeing this thing in how God saw it. Um, in fact, in fact, uh, 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 the complementary identity of male and female sexuality form the basis of sexual wholeness. There it is again. Sex is the, is, is, is the state of being, not an activity. So sexual wholeness comes between the marriage union of the husband and wife when they are married, because that is which reflects the image of, uh, that is which reflects the image of God. And Let's, let me just put it out there. Um, I want to slow it down a little bit so it can sink in for somebody. Um, sex is about pleasure. If, if, if you didn't know, a female has certain organs that are purely designed just for sexual pleasure. Um, if you want to know more, you can DM me. I'll send you my email and I'll tell you about that. Men, I hope you're paying attention. Go home and ask to your wives. Um, um, if they have no clue, y'all need to book a sex therapy session with me. I could walk you through what that is. Even if you're 15, you think you've been doing it right. You may, you may learn a few things. Uh, um, um, certainly, I've seen it. Couples who have been married for 25 years and they discover certain things in, in some of these workshops that I conduct. But, but I, I just wanted to slow down that part that sex is about pleasure. In fact, the Garden of Eden, when you literally translate it, it is the Garden of Pleasure. It's as if God was sprinkling all these, these traces of, like, uh, 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 um, of what he was doing between these two. And he was... He was, he was getting them to really understand really what it means to be in a union 
off marriage for right now I'm talking about in the context of just sex I could talk a little bit more and one of the interesting thing about sex is that there is a bonding hormone called oxytocin when a couple has sex it is released and um, it helps a couple bond more often it helps a couple cement their marriage uh, 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 relationship and you've heard of the term that the marriage has not been consummated. The marriage has not been consummated. I think maybe they borrowed it and got it from that, how God created uh, us to be. So, so research has actually stated that couples need to have sex at least, at least once a month. Uh, but I would dare say if you're having sex once a month, uh, that, that may have its own concerns unless if it is medically prescribed, uh, unless if you're fasting and praying, um, but yeah, that's that's a long fast for sex. But uh, this oxytocin hormone is actually released in the brain, in the body, and it allows you to bond. And the bonding is kept alive and well. Um, 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 but what we have observed is that pleasure uh, without love gradually kills the capacity uh, for pleasure. Because when you really uh, boil it down, image of God as I unpacked yesterday is about God. Who is God? God is love. So if we're made in the image of God, we are made in the image to receive and give capacity, to have the capacity to give and to receive love. So pleasure that is outside of the context of the image of God will gradually kill the capacity for pleasure. And we certainly see that more often we tell our young people, uh, don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex. But we never really give them a reason as to why you should not have sex. Sex is in the context of the image of God. Outside of that context of the image of God, which is love, it gradually kills the capacity for pleasure, such that when you are now married, your pleasure is skewed a little bit. Can they be healing? Yes, certainly they can be healing. Uh, they can be recuperation from that. And while I'm at it, that oxytocin hormone that is released, you are continually bonding yourself to different partners. You are bonding yourself to that man. You are bonding yourself to that woman. And you move on to the next person. You are bonding, you're bonding. There is a spiritual union that is being done as well. And those are some of the reasons that we may give to our young people when they ask them the question, why shouldn't I? Because this thing is good, y'all. Those who have tasted it are saying, why should I not? And the only thing we tell them is don't. And sometimes we open the biblical text and, and, and fall short of being practical about some of these things. So sex is about pleasure. Um, sex transcends itself by pointing to love. It points to love. And really, by pointing to love, sex points to God. That is the pre-fall biblical analysis and foundation of what sex is about, sex and sexuality is about. This is before the fall. This is purely before um, Satan saw that something was good in this. As I mentioned earlier on, Satan's first attack was on the family. And <laughs> in essence, his first attack was on sex and sexuality. So, that's a biblical foundation that we um, 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 that 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 we have, and um, if taken out of that context, sex as an end in itself always falls short of delivering what it promises. I can certainly say to some ladies out there, um, married people who have been married out there, you get started. And he is done before you are done. Um, and the reason why it falls short of what it delivers is because sex was the end of the whole exercise. We need to take away this idea that, um, that we have learned and adopted it, perhaps have been taught that sex is about orgasm. No, sex is about pleasure. Pleasure in the context of the image of God. Pleasure in the context of a full realization of wholeness. If it is only about an orgasm, yeah, I, I have sat across many women who have complained in couple of sessions saying that 
I, I barely get orgasms. My husband is done before I'm done. Um, I am frustrated, Kingsley. Can you help us? And in my head, I'm like, well, I don't know if I can really delve deep into that. Are you ready for what is coming your way? But so if sex is an end um, to itself, now I'm not discounting the ideas of, uh, 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 I don't know what you call it, quickies. Quickies in the context of the Western world is when we don't have time, uh, the baby just fell asleep for those who have just had new babies and we just want to sneak it in there. Those are fair and fine, but ultimately, if it's just the, an end to itself uh, and it is taken out, it will fall short of delivering what it promises. Now, come Satan has a conversation with Eve. Satan was jealous of sex and sexuality. He was like, y'all, these, these, these two folks are enjoying something that's deep. I gotta make sure I distort this thing. I just want to make sure that I pollute this thing because when sex is polluted, it is polluting the image of God. It is polluting and distorting the image of God. So the fragmentation of the story of sexual wholeness uh, began to form. Satan knew the implications of the people that knew and understood the identity. So he uses perverted sex. And, and really, I, I started asking myself, why sex? And again, because at the core, it distorts the image of who God is. Over and over, if you're engaging in premarital sex, it is a distortion of the image of God. Who is God? God is love. And uh, sometimes some people have equated receiving and giving sex as receiving love. Um, you don't want to engage in premarital sex, but you feel like you have to engage in premarital sex because that is your uh, uh, um, indication that you love the individual. And certainly men or women will use that to guilt trip you to say, hey, if you love me, you would. A distorted image of God. And surprisingly, after the fall, God repeatedly used metaphors of spiritual adultery to communicate ideas of rebellion. He uses infidelity to articulate broken relationships and people that have wandered away from their loving God. And Paul, Paul really weighs in on this subject. He says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Really, his identity or is what to God has called him to to be or immorality, immorality, that Greek word when literally translated uh, is uh, poinia, where we get the word pornography. Um, pornography, a, a direct attack on the image of God. I can unpack that a little bit more, um, but really immorality is, is self-destruction. The body, when you're committing immorality, you are self-destructing. You are doing away with what God has called you to be. Your true identity as a child of God, as a man, as a woman, um, as to what is God has called you to be. We are created as sexual beings uh, with an inclination to have feelings and desires that affect of our nature. But what capitalist society has done is they have used sales and marketing strategies that exploits sexuality to sell products. Several years ago, I think it was about 15 years ago, I was, um, I was watching a commercial, uh, an advertisement, and um, it was a burger, uh, a, burger, uh, a burger commercial. And on the commercial, they had this woman who was wearing a bikini. Um, she had big breasts, yeah, uh, I say it. She had big breasts. She had a beautiful body. She was holding a burger and she was promoting the, 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 the brand. And in my head, and I said, as I watched that, what does a burger have to do with a naked woman with big breasts, with a beautiful body? But yeah, go figure. It was trying to sell something. Sex has been used now as a tool to sell clothing lines and premarital sex certainly has been normalized on TV and movies. Um, criminals profit from, 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 from 
uh, this idea of sex and sexuality, really distorting and damaging the image of God. Human trafficking is, is, is the new modern day slavery. If you thought that the slavery of black people, the slavery of Jewish people was huge and significant. If you wanna go back to Nero, where he persecuted Christians, took him into slavery and all of that stuff, all of those combined, all of those combined do not measure up to the human sexual trafficking that's happening right now. If you think about it, if you, um, if you look at studies and research, young boys are, and girls are sold like animals and even young women now. I know I hear of stories, people of, that leave Africa to go and work in diaspora in Dubai, in China, and, and some people that come from Mexico coming into the US and South America, uh, coming to the land of milk and honey. Uh, they have been given these opportunities. Somebody buys them a visa, uh, buy, buy them an air ticket, and they come in and they are kept and sold into slavery. People coming in from India um, and they are now exploited. That industry right now has about annually 4.8 million people being sexually exploited a year. That's, that's huge. And TV shows, movies, it's interesting, I was reading this, that porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Go figure how many people are on Netflix. Go figure how many people are on Amazon. Amazon. And go figure how many people are on Twitter. Porn sites. And this is referring to predominantly Pornhub, one of the big uh, sites. Uh, a study was conducted in one of the university here in Canada, University of Montreal. Um, they wanted to do a research uh, um, to find out um, how many people or how many young men in their early 20s or in their 20s that have never consumed pornography. They went into the university, put out flyers and put out everything. And this is a university of easily about uh, 20, 30,000 and, and, and of course, this is not only men, uh, it's a mixture of men and women, I would assume that number is higher for women. Uh, and they put out this ad saying, they're looking for people that have not consumed pornography at any point in time in their lives. They could not find any. Granted, the, uh, the, the ads did not reach everybody, but the fact that they could not find anybody in their 20s in a university this large tells us about this epidemic that we are facing right now. We have all kinds of, uh, of, um, of, of relationship orientations. Um, there is a new term in the sex therapy world. It's called um, ethical non-monogamy. We're familiar with monogamy, but now there is ethical non-monogamy, which means that there's polyamory. Polyamory simply means that you are married, you are a couple, but um, there is an agreement that your husband or your wife can go ahead and fall in love with multiple other people. Uh, I've heard of some crazy stories where um, a husband is sitting at home, uh, the wife is going on a date with another man, polyamory relationships, and the polyamory boyfriend comes in and knocks on the door and the wife is dressed up looking nice and looking good. And um, he's, she says, Honey, I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow. And the husband says, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Have fun. That's polyamory. Many loves. Poly means many. Amory means love. And there is open relationships where a couple decides that to open an open relationship. We, you probably heard of that from Jada uh, uh, and Will Smith, where they open the relationship. What that simply means is that we are married, but our relationship is open. You go ahead and sleep with other people. Just make sure that you don't bring any disease, make sure you use protection. And then we come back to a relationship and everything goes up fine. They are semi-open relationship. There is the hookup culture. Uh, all of these ideas are absent, really the true essence of the image of God, which is love. Uh, um, I had a conversation with a psychologist um, um, I have a podcast. Uh, my podcast is called Relationship Factor. It's really about um, relationships uh, and how we experience relationships. And I had a guest on my podcast. Um, I created it specifically for the unchurched. It's not a Bible study. Um, I, I don't quote Bible verses, 
by all means, I uh, use biblical principles, but I just don't state them. I meant to reach the unchurched in the context of relationships and sex. And so I had a guest, a psychologist, before we went into the podcast, and um, she said to me, we were not built for monogamy. That's why open relationships are the best alternatives. And this is a trained individual, master's level individual, um, doctor level individual, who is saying that we were not trained for, we were not designed for monogamy. This is counter biblical beliefs. And I could tell you countless stories on how this is perpetuated. So where do we go uh, from here? Um, 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 where do we go from here? Um, this is the reality GK Chesterton um, outlined. Every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. And I would dare say, Every man who goes out and cheats or um, every woman who goes out and cheats, at the core of it is really looking for God. I could tell you a little bit more on reasons why people cheat, but at the core of it, um, you are looking for God. So, so where do we go? Where do we go from here? First Corinthians 7 verse 3, um, it says, this is one of my favorite verses. Um, I tried quoting it in, a, in my first year of marriage. Yeah, it it did not go well. Um, by the way, it, it, it was spiritual abuse the way I did it. Um, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. Uh, Paul goes on to say, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together again so that Satan will, Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self control. I want to qualify this statement by saying that um, husbands and wives, as you engage in a sexual activity, stop looking at sex as the means to an end. Stop looking at orgasm as the means to an end. Start looking at pleasure. Now, when you begin to look at pleasure, then this verse becomes null and void. Because now everybody's looking to get in pleasure. Everybody's looking to participate and be a part of this exercise. I mean, who doesn't want pleasure? Um, uh, uh, um, get freaky, um, play around, um, um, uh, take the kids to grandma, um, uh, have it on the couch, uh, have it on bed, uh, try it in the kitchen, bless every room, um, make it about pleasure, enjoy it. Um, but, but when you are doing it, be mindful that you are living out the image of God, the wholesome of who God has called you to be. So the marriage bed is supposed to be a place of reciprocity. Um, I remember listening to somebody who said that, well, uh, I just give my husband a buffet. Um, a buffet, by the way, you, if you remember, you crawl, when you go to a buffet, the food is just lying there. Uh, you just go and pick and pick and go and eat. And so what they were communicating was that, well, if he keeps bugging me for sex, I just lie there and just open up my legs. He'll just have a buffet. And that's what we have almost taken sex to be. Um, a buffet, not um, reciprocity. So the marriage bed is supposed to be a reciprocity where the love of God and the image of God is revealed and celebrated. And, and, and to... To the single, to the single, I, I know we often talk about sex and sexuality in the context of those who are married, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman his own to have her own husband. Um, to, 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 to the single, um, verse seven as well. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not Paul. Paul was never married. However, each man has his own gift from God. One in this manner and the other in that. Um, singleness is a gift. Um, uh, and I think once we begin to espouse the idea that singleness is a gift, many of us will begin to comprehend and understand the fact that um, we, we ought to hold off on certain things until they're in their proper context. You are not broken when you have sexual desires and fantasies if you are single. 
No, you are not broken. You are human. But wait for it until you experience it in the proper context. With all vigilance, keep your heart for from it comes the source of life. Your time will come. Meanwhile, don't develop scars about what love is. Don't develop scars of what the image of God is. Don't develop scars about limiting beliefs, rather, as we had spoken about earlier on. Um, I'm unlovable. Uh, I'm only good if I deliver. Don't develop scars that you get outside of the context of marriage and then you bring them into your marriage bed. Certainly, that can be devastating to a marriage uh, uh, a marriage union. Uh, and certainly, we often highlight um, uh, 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 the do's and don'ts of our theology. Don't, 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 don't. But purity, I want to posit to you that purity is not the absence of something. Purity is not the absence of sex. Purity, in its biblical sense, it is the presence of someone in your life, and that is Christ. More often, we want to tout and teach and articulate and pontificate that purity is about not drinking. Purity is about not having sex. Purity is about not watching pornography. Purity is about all of these things. But in reality, purity is about the presence of someone in your life. God understands that you, you all get thirsty sometimes. God under, the Holy Spirit understands he created you. So if you have that wholeness and presence of God in your life, that will help you deal with certain urges and, and thirsts that you, you have. And sex is truly about the gospel. It's not what you do and don't. It's about recognizing who is in you. That's purity and that's Christ in you. Sex is, is, is good, y'all. Singleness is good and celibacy is good. Biblical sex and sexuality is a celebration of God's image. Sex after the fall has, has, has certainly been, been, been lost, but I do believe that um, there is restoration that can occur. That is restoration that occur in 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 marriages by um, rethinking pleasure, uh, rethinking pleasure, uh, and rethinking the image of God, and rethinking what this is truly about. Sex after the fall, is truly about a lost identity. So my appeal to, to every one of us is really about, let's get back to the true identity of who God is through sex. Um, let's get back to who and what God is calling us to be through sex. That's an interesting way of looking at recommitment to God. And for the couples that are present on this platform and um, you have not gotten any, um, I would encourage and implore you to be tender with each other, uh, to be kind to each other. Go ahead and have fun. Go ahead and have pleasure. Give it up tonight, y'all. Um, give it up tonight. So that's my premise this morning. Sex is a state of being. Uh, image of God. It's not an activity that we, uh, that we engage, uh, that we engage in. Uh, we'll, call, uh, we'll end it, we'll, we'll, we'll end it here for today. Okay. Um, no, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for that powerful presentation. I see the, the comments are, are buzzing. Um, uh, there's someone who says um, they're laughing out loud at, at the buffet situation, you know, where somebody says, okay, here it is, then do what thou wilt, you know. <laughs> So, um, which is which is which is which is what what happens a whole lot. I, as you were speaking, there's something that came to my mind, particularly um, during bridal showers. You hear older ladies sitting you down as a little young Mangoti and saying to you that, eh, "My child, eh, you must never deny your husband. Even if you're angry, you must be angry from the bottom going up, and from the bottom going down, you must not be angry." 
you know, and there, lately there's been a pushback from young ladies like that. That's not possible. That is that is impossible. What you are expecting of us, if that's what you did, then good for you, but it's not going to work for us. And I think what you've just said emphasizes that, that if it's for pleasure, then the pleasure should be for both of us. Then it can't be that one is a buffet laid out on the table while the other is coming <laughs> to pick and eat. You know, yeah. um, emphasizing the importance of, of enjoyment. I, I'm also of the view that a lot of time, because of such views that um, for a very long time, sex has been for men and not women, yeah. right? Um, yeah. As young ladies were told to keep yourself for marriage, um, but boys don't get told that, right? So you're keeping yourself then for a man, for his pleasure. And you get married and then you are told that, no, 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 you must always give your husband, never deny him, right? And again, still emphasizing that it's it's for the men and not for the ladies. And you've been to also told that you must keep yourself, keep yourself, keep yourself for years. And then all of a sudden, this guy wants you to open, 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 open. It's a shock to the system. Immediately. Exactly, right? <laughs> Which is quite If you love me. Exactly. And the other the other issue is that so so sex has been used to divide to define your value as a woman, that when you don't have it, then you're very valuable. And when you have it, your value just decreases and plummets. So now you're telling the same young lady who's been hearing this message to come from this 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 place of being told not to do it to a place of doing it. How can we help young women to move from that space, to look at sex as a positive thing, to look at sex as a pleasurable thing for them as well, and not a chore and not something that is for the man and not something that devalues them, but something that is meant to be enjoyed, something that is meant to elevate the experience in the marriage and of course, um, their relationship with God. How do we help them go from that to what they need to be? Uh, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I would speak to the ladies last. Okay. I will start with the grandmas first. Um, nice. Grandmas, grandmas, um, I think uh, grandmas have had, uh, for the lack of being rebuked, um, let me see if my grandma is here. Um, uh, she, but my grandma is more than she wouldn't mind. Um, I think, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, we need to speak to the grandmas first and say, grandma, your view of giving yourself over to, uh, to, your, to, your, to your husband is outdated. It worked for you. Um, so stop telling these young ladies, um, stop telling these young ladies to go the buffet style. Um, tell them about the slow cooker sex. You know, a slow cooker, you put it in the morning, um, you let it simmer, you spice it up. It cooks for many hours. Um, um, stop telling about them about the pressure cooker sex, whereby now, um, um, if, 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 if now, now, stop guilt tripping them. Well, if you don't give it up, he's going to go and look for it out there. And that's legit. And that's, that's real. And I think that's one of the crucial things that we need to start off uh, with the grandmas and with the aunts when they sit these young ladies down change the goal from them being just a container for a male organ to come in. So we need to change that. So that's with the grandmas. Um, secondly, to the men, um, uh, there is such a thing called foreplay. Um, newsflash uh, for you men, um, if the, the women's body, it changes, uh, the women's cervix, uh, 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 can I use terms here, uh, Wokolo, without having been re rebuked here? Uh, can I? Can I? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's a biological term. I don't think. All right, it's a biological term. All right, I, I, I tend to be comfortable, but I want to be sensitive. So the vagina of a woman, um, when it is aroused, it changes shape, it elongates and, 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 and flattens out. If it is not aroused, it stays in a position that's awkward. So if you want to have that quickie sex and you go in, it is painful, it is uncomfortable, it is even dry. But if you take the time to foreplay, if you take the time to engage her, to talk with her, it changes shape, it elongates, it lubricates, it is ready for you. And that's where the pleasure comes in. So as men, we, we need to start getting into the idea of foreplay. Uh, and the other thing about these ideas of foreplay and all that stuff, um, 
sex, the Bible doesn't use the word sex. It uses the word to know. Um, it uses the word to know. In some sense, a part of what we do and how we do sex is also a social construct. The Bible never said this is the position. You've heard of people talk about the missionary position uh, as if that's the Bible position. No, the Bible doesn't talk about that. There is a social construct around that. So as couples, as, 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 as individuals have foreplay, play around. You all try all kinds of positions, have fun. Ask her, what do you want today? How do you want me to go for it today? You know, strategize and, and, and plan for it. Um, and so this is to the men to say, hey, uh, gentlemen, we have fallen short. Uh, we, we, we need to step up our game. And for those that have been doing it, hey, kudos to you, but we need to step up our game. Now coming to the women, because sometimes what we tend to do is we talk to the women as if they're the ones who are broken. They are the ones we need to fix certain things, but the deck, the card decks have been stacked against them for generations of the generation. And when now they're saying, no, I'm not doing that, we're saying they're being rebellious, they're being promiscuous. So to the woman who feels like they have been uh, 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 subjugated to this, the exercise I gave yesterday, um, go ahead and try it, sheet of paper, go ahead and talk about and write down the messages you have learned about sex. Uh, from your family, from school, which is the next place where you spend a whole lot of hours, the church, um, and then kind of have some negative beliefs around that. And then switch now to look into the positive beliefs about sex. You are not worth um, what you can give or can't give. So uh, I, I, I don't want to answer your question directly. I want to speak to the aunts and the grandmas and speak to the men and just liberate the woman. It's as if when we talk about these, these, these topics of dress, it's an attack on women, but we never really talk about all the other things that men wear and do. Yeah, I didn't answer your question, but I kind of answered your question, Well, I hope that's helpful. No, it is very helpful. It is very helpful. Um, I think I think we needed that because for the longest time, women have been made the gatekeepers of sex. So um, if 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 people have an affair, it's the woman who's going to get blamed for it, and not so much the men. In fact, men, we we have terms like no, he's fallen, he's weak. But for the woman, it's, it's it's much more harsher because you're the gatekeeper of sex. I mean, come on, how could you allow such a thing to happen? You know, so so it's it's good and liberating to hear that the, the, the perspective has been towards one party for a very long time, that it should actually be a, a broader perspective. And that is why then we'll have the conversations of your skirt was too short. That's why you got raped, because again, you're expected to be the gatekeeper of sex, even if somebody has forcefully has forced themselves on you, you know, which has mm. been quite unreasonable. So it has been a breath of fresh air to hear that perspective perspective that um, perhaps we need to change the perspective of doing things and, and, and looking in the approach in it. That's where then other things will resolve themselves in essence. So there's been a comment here um, in my inbox that says that uh, we are told that most women are not having orgasms um, from social media and it is an anatomy issue or failure of men to press the right buttons. So which is it? Is it both or is it, is it, is it the failure on one party or, or what's happening? Is it the women who just can't relax enough? Is it the men who just are pressing the wrong things? What's happening there? How do we help each other to get, for all of us to get to the promised land? Right. To the promised land, the garden of pleasure. Yes, I like Amen. that. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Here's the interesting thing is um, my, my practice, I, I, my private practice, I see mainly couples. Uh, often dealing with sexual issues, and I see singles. 70% of the singles that I see are women. 30% uh, or less are men. And of those 70%, uh, two of the common issues that I see is low sex drive or low sexual desire or low libido, and I'm not getting an orgasm. Now, I wanna correct a few myths around that uh, and then perhaps get to an answer. Um, um, number one, um, um, maybe let me liberate the men a little bit first because I'm a man here. So we, we can't beat the men all the way through. 
um, it is not the men's responsibility to give you an orgasm. An orgasm is a state of mind in the woman. You can actually get to a point where you can actually feel your pelvic floor muscles, how you use them and your state of mind and being mindful that you can actually get an orgasm. So it is a woman's responsibility to have and achieve an orgasm. Now, 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 let me also liberate the women. Um, the table has to be set. As I mentioned earlier on that foreplay, touching, kissing, and whatnot may, um, it arouses the woman, changes the posture of the vagina and the cervix. It gets them to that particular state of being ready to achieve that particular place. Um, so, so the misnomer is that it's a man's responsibility. It's not the man's responsibility. And uh, it is the man's responsibility to be a part of this equation of setting the table together as a couple. There is another misnomer of the fact that um, you have to touch the right spot. Newsflash, there is no such thing as a G spot. Um, there is no such thing as a G spot. Um, uh, uh, um, the, the female's anatomy has a thing that appears at the front called a clitoris. The clitoris is not that, that tiny little thing that shows up there. Uh, we have come to discover through a research that it actually goes in deep and it actually goes around the vagina opening. Uh, newsflash for some of you that don't know, I'll, I'll go a little bit detail, but I think I've said that it's, uh, if it's PG, um, maybe you might want to move away if it's uncomfortable. But the clitoris, that thing at the top there, um, men, if you touch that, it's sensitive. Uh, gently, um, when a woman is uh, um, aroused, it swells because blood is flowing to that area. Um, so for women, if you are exercising that area, that pelvic floor area, it allows blood to flow to that area even much more when you're aroused. So that helps with orgasm. So uh, that clitoris thing is actually around and deep inside beyond. So if you wanted to achieve orgasm, you wanna pay attention to that area, touching that area, going in deep um, and being able to stimulate that area. And there's a myth too. Eh, I'm gonna correct a few myths here of a myth, the fact that um, a penis has to be long in order to pleasure women, that's a lie. Girth is what matters, the width, because the nerve endings around are actually around and at the top there. So if it's deep, it'll go into the cervix and they'll just complain that it's painful. Um, and um, I had a couple that came in and, uh, uh, and they had been married for several years. And uh, the, the wife revealed something that actually shocked the husband. Um, the wife said, you know what? Sometimes when I'm screaming, when we're having sex, it's not that I'm enjoying it. It's because it's painful. And the husband thought, said, oh, you know what? I thought you were enjoying it. And I was going hard and I was doing something amazing. Like, no, 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 no. It's painful. So the girth stimulates around. It actually works. So uh, ladies, be gentle with your husband, if it is short and small, the girth is what's important around. So orgasm is your female, is a female's responsibility. Setting the table is for the two of you. I've given you some ideas on how to actually reach it. Mindfulness, because sometimes if you're stressed in a difficult place and you're not present, you won't reach orgasm. If it is always about him uh, coming to get his fix and the goal is orgasm, you won't reach orgasm. I hope that's 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 helpful, Boko. No, it's very helpful. It's very helpful. Um, you've straightened a few myths, though. I still think there's a key spot, but okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the thing about that is the the clitoris goes in. If you touch a little bit deeper in, I'm going to teach you a few things, man. If you touch about this much with your finger in deep inside, you're still touching the clitoris. It's not a G spot. 
it's still the clitoris. So you're stimulating the whole that thing. There's about 8,000 nerve endings in a vagina clitoris that can be stimulated. And for all we know for now, research simply tells us that thing is only created for pleasure. So women are supposed to be enjoying it much more. And we thank God for that. God is so good, you know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There's a comment here. This person's name is Galaxy, so um, I like the name so that they can ask whatever or say whatever. Um, the comment says, if both parties must have pleasure and must not deprive each other, is it fair for a partner to come to the play unprepared, especially where there is a health condition from the man's side and the woman is just um, expected to serve, even though it's not Im uh, impressive at all? Wow. Uh, especially when one could do something about it, example, exercise to improve his health state? That question is vague. I, I'm going to assume health condition for the man is either in erectile dysfunction. Mm. I, I, I don't know how to answer it, Bokolo. If, if you could um, add a little bit more on that, on that. But I'm going to assume. Yeah, that, that was my assumption as well. That was my assumption as well, that there could be issues of erectile dysfunction. Yet, as a woman, you're still expected to come in and enjoy it. But it's it's only a party for two-minute noodles and then... <laughs> There's another term, two-minute noodles. I've heard of a buffet <laughs> and two-minute noodles. <laughs> um, so uh, if it's a case of erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation, um, there, there are a couple of things that you could do. Um, one of the things, generally, when I counsel for uh, for sexual concern or sexual issues, about sixty percent of the time or seventy percent of the time, it is psychological uh, trauma, of, uh, and sometimes it is it is very few or rare uh, that the organ itself is not actually working. Um, stress can cause. Um, erectile dysfunction, uh, where it's just not getting up. Um, uh, and sometimes because we live in a society, especially from our African context, uh, the man is supposed to always deliver, deliver. It's pandemic. He loses his job. Um, we have not fully explored the idea of depression as well. A depression is real. And when somebody is depressed, the last thing they are thinking about is sex. And that's how one of the things we, we diagnose depression, losing interest in the things that a person once loved and enjoyed. So for me, I would maybe step away from just talking about the organs a little bit and talk about diagnose and assess stress in your relationship and stress in your life. Um, certainly because of this liberation uh, of the women movement, there are women who have higher sex drive. I have had several women who come into my office and say, Kingsley, he doesn't give it up. Like I, I, I would like to have it um, uh, three, four times in a week. I'm like, bless you. Um, and um, he, he just, he's just good with once or twice a week. Um, I don't know what's going on. So that's something to contend with. It may not be a problem or anything psychological. It's just the fact that one is a higher sex drive. One has a lower sex drive have communication. And one thing that um, the two of you could do to, to curb this is to have sex dates, plan. Um, I know many of you were having premarital sex. I won't call your names, but when you were having premarital sex, you actually planned, you planned, you put sex on a calendar. Remember how you'd say, I'm going to go over to his or her house or she's gonna come over. I'm gonna have protection. I'm gonna have all of these things. That was actually planned sex that was put on a calendar. Now you are in the proper context in marriage and things are a little bit, why not put it on a calendar? Um, why not put it on a calendar? Um, and I think that's crucial for us to be able to understand that there are certain things that we can do to be able to, uh, to help with these health conditions. Uh, number one, put it on a calendar. And when you put it on the calendar, set the mood. Number two, talk about the stress in your life and really what's happening, because that's sometimes the problem. And number three, uh, I'm, I'm going to say it. Yeah, this pastor, this therapist said it. Uh, Y'all go ahead and go down on your wives. Um, if that's your thing, do it. 
Um, the tongue has a way of weaving in there and doing some amazing things that your penis cannot do. If you're thinking of, 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 of hygiene, your mouth actually has more germs than the vagina does. Uh, if there's any dentist here, they can tell you that, hey, that, that, that thing is, is actually, it's a self-cleaning machine. It's clean. Take a shower. If he's having some erectile dysfunction conditions, dude, if you want to still have pleasure, hey, go down on her. Let her enjoy. Uh, 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 go ahead and enjoy. Go ahead and go ahead and get creative, y'all. God created it. It's, it's, it's pleasure. I mean, some of you all are done having children, or maybe you're not considering having children yet. Uh, um, so that's fine. So, so those are some of a few tips there um, 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 for people to try out, uh, assuming that, that health, uh, health condition, if that's what I assumed to have been for men, you can exercise. There is such a thing as a pelvic floor for men. Really, erectile dysfunction is uh, blood not flowing there. Um, and one where you, uh, uh, I'll give you my contact details. If anyone wants to reach out, I could send out a few emails here and there. Um, if I'm feeling gracious and I have time, I may zoom in and just do couples and work through them with some of these issues. You can contact Wokolo or Family Life and see if I, if I do have some time to be able to do that. So those are some of the things that you can explore. I have an anonymous question here that I want to just go ahead and touch on, Boko Olay, if that's okay. Can you give some advice on living in a marriage without sex? Um, um, and I would assume that that perhaps is not the only one. I've come to observe that without sex um, could mean a whole lot of things. As I mentioned earlier on, it is psychological. Um, what's really happening is a trauma. Was it sexual abuse in the past um, that occurred and the individual is shining away? Um, is the male or female shining away because of that trauma that they endured and they experienced? So that's one question I would have. Uh, if that is the case, go ahead and seek help. It is not necessarily a voluntary decision to be choose not to have sex. Uh, number two, um, is it because he's having sex outside or he's having uh, sex uh, at other places, then you need to explore um, 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 uh, in stopping that um, and having the conversation, what does sex look like? Um, I'd be curious to know more, why are you not having sex? Because if you're not having sex, remember oxytocin, the bonding hormone is, is not being released. Um, um, I would imagine if you're not having sex, it means that you're not communicating, you're not planning together finances. If you have children, it means that you're not parenting together. You're not really being a tag team. So I have more questions if we can throw in a few things here. Um, medical reasons, medical reasons. If it is medical reasons, um, I don't know who is having the medical reasons experience. Um, it is almost, I'm gonna use the word better um, for the lack of, uh, just being sensitive to the medical condition, it is it is it is better if it is the man who has medical uh, reasons, and um, because the men can go down on their wife. Even so, if it is the man, it is a woman who has medical reasons. Um, the woman can go down on their um, on their on their husband, um, because really, ultimately, it is an intimate bonding. We understand that there's medical conditions. Um, and while you are in treatment, I know that some of my clients that have gone through chemo, um, it affects them significantly. So there are other ways of being able to pleasure. Um, certainly, um, there are some, some sex toys. Uh, I know all some of y'all ladies on this platform use them. Uh, you may not confess, but there are some sex toys. Um, and with that context of using and exploring this oral sex, sex toys, I want to be mindful that we keep in context of what sex is. It's a state of being. It is really keeping in context of the image of God. It is the union that the two of you agreed. And I know sometimes sex toys can be an ego problem for men. Are you telling me that my tools are not working? 
No, no, it's not that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would be curious to know more on those, um, but there are certain alternatives that you can talk about. Be open to exploring other things if it's medical conditions. All right, that was that was a, a mouthful, but yeah, um, we we appreciate that that um, there are other things that can be done. You know that it doesn't always have to be penetration for it to be classified as sex. Um, you know, you you come across things like tantric sex, um, particularly when you go to the Asian side of the world. You come across things like unyaza or kachabali if you are in the African um, context. And because now we are baptized, we are now renewed in Christ, there's a lot of things that we're expected to leave behind, you know, that no, 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 we don't do this anymore, we don't do that anymore. And amongst those things that we're expected to leave behind is things, is practices like that, um, where, which bring pleasure to both partners, but because, like you were saying earlier, that it's the missionary position that is considered mm. holy and acceptable. So now that you're a Christian woman, Christian man, how do you even try to even conjure up or think of other things? How do you even think of exploring other things? Because we've already turned them as evil, right? That if anybody's right. gonna attempt catch up value or tantric sex, it's evil. So what, what is your view on that one? How should, is it worth even trying or should we just stick to missionary and amen? <laughs> um, there are a couple of things when we come to these um, other sexual practices or experiences. They are a spiritual exercise in and of themselves. Uh, tantric sex and all of these things, they have a spiritual context and connotation. So when we begin to take them and cross them over into the, remember the image of God, uh, love, um, mutual pleasure, reciprocity, giving and receiving pleasure. Um, we don't wanna distort that image. Um, certainly tantric sex, does not own the rights to donkey style, does not own the rights to spooning, does not own the rights to many of these positions and all that stuff. So let's, let's, let's disabuse ourselves of the notion that um, um, it is reserved for them. But if you begin to practice those things, be mindful that you are getting into some spiritual exercises. You are getting into tapping into some other demonic places that you may be or may not be aware in its truest sense if you practice them in its truest sense. So that's one thing that I want you to be aware of. And I and, and the Christian, when you come across culture, uh, there is this false idea that Christianity is a culture that's a lie from the pit of hell. Uh, uh, Christianity is not a culture. Christianity is a lens. Um, on how to sift through your own culture. It is a biblical lens. So if your culture has certain things, um, um, you put on the lens of, of Christianity, does it pass through the lens of Christianity? Oh yeah, it's good, I can go ahead and do it. So culture is not bad, culture can cross over, but I want you to be mindful of the fact that in and of themselves, these things are spiritual exercises. They have demonic uh, 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 things. Certainly, we see that in the book of Jeremiah, the book of Isaiah. God calls it, um, um, God rebuked the Moabites over and over and over. The Moabites would put anything and everything that had a hole. Uh, um, uh, and God says, no, this is, this is disgusting. And uh, then later on, God says, do not marry a Moabite woman. Because the all Moabite women are freaks. They, they will do certain things that, 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 that you would like and they will take you away from me. And so there's a warning around that. All right, no, I've got- There's a, there's a question that I have here. Um, it's in the context of sex and sexuality, okay. uh, infidel, uh, infertility uh, and choice. Uh, I've seen this a lot of times and we put a pressure mainly on our young ladies and young couples, when we start off by saying, so when are you getting married? When are you getting married? And the moment they get married, when are you having children? We want grandchildren. That can be a little bit hard. And I want to talk to y'all church by saying that sometimes it's hard. For some people, they can't conceive. That's a lot of pressure. In fact, when you put the pressure of trying to conceive, you're taking away the image of God. 
because the love and the pleasure becomes absent. Yes, Bible says go ahead and procreate, but we know that after the fall, things have not worked out the same way that they're supposed to. So if infertility is a part of your relationship and it is occurring in your relationship, I think as a church, we need to be sensitive and talk about that. Be sensitive to that. And I, I want to talk to the aunties and the gogos there. And sometimes even the grandpas there. You all got to chill with this business of uh, when, I, when am I getting my grandkids? Uh, it's, it's pressure. It's, it's pressure. And certainly with our generation now, um, my wife and I waited three, four years, three, four years before we actually had children. Um, and so some couples are waiting that long to actually cement and enjoy and to do other things. Uh, we're seeing certainly that um, people are waiting, they're exploring life. We're living in a time where these young couples, they are woke. They're not just going to get married and immediately start having babies. Uh, they want to travel the world. They are professionals and uh, they're making good money. They want to travel and explore the world. And certainly some of these things, when you start having children, um, you have to change your, your schedule and the way and how you flow. And for those couples that choose not to have children, there is no biblical text that says that you must have children. Um, uh, there, is no, there is a Bible text that uh, be fruitful and multiply. If that is the case, then those who have infertility, their marriages are messed up because they can't. The opposite is true for the couples that choose you know, to have children, but it has to be a collective agreement between the two of them. As long as the image of God is present, they are receiving and giving love and the pleasure is there, speaking in the context of sex, that's not, that's not the only thing. So that's crucial for us to be able to understand. As church, we need to normalize and to be able to, to, work, to deal kindly and tenderly with some of these things. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Things are not as cut and dry as they used to be. You know, um, a lot of us young women are getting fibroids and cysts and all of these things. Yes. Um, and of course, men also are getting all sorts of diseases that were not as prevalent then as they are now. So there are a lot of reasons why people might not um, be, be, be willing or wanting to have kids. There's another question here that says, um, how do you deal with sexual sexuality? Um, after you have become a widow or are divorced. I think this is coming from a person who's probably saying your body's used to having sex every now and again. Now you've been separated through with this partner, be it through death, be it through divorce. What happens now? Because now your body's going to be saying, hello, madam, uh, when are we now crossing <laughs> over to the other side? When are we reaching the promised land? What's happening, right? That your body doesn't <laughs> die doing, with your partner or divorce itself from you when your partner divorces you. How, how do we help our sisters, our brothers to deal with that now? Shock to the system of you no longer have someone now who's going to be intimate. Uh, I have a difficult answer for that and really an answer, another side of the answer that may not be um, a norm. Um, they say start with the good news a little bit that maybe the, the, negative, the bad news would be, quote unquote, bad news would be received differently. Um, you all need to go back into the dating game. I don't know. Um, it's been difficult. You've lost somebody whom you've spent many years with and you've loved them. You've invested your life. It's gut wrenching. It's painful. But when the healing takes place, put out a word. The gogos and the aunties, they, 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 they can get some feelers. They, they, they can get some feelers out there. And I think there's no shame. And you going back. Because sometimes I've spoken to elderly ladies who say, ah, going back to figuring another man, uh, my children. Um, um, but that's a neglection of your own wholeness as a human being because sexuality and sex is a part of who you are. So um, go back into the dating game. Um, I don't know um, how old that person is or how old the person people may be. Get back into the dating game. I'm certain that there's somebody who is about your age that you may like. Um, if you are still catching those feelings, which means you're checking out men or women out there, um, get some feelers, get back into the dating game. Um, um, <clears throat> get back into the dating game. 
and and see who you can see out there. On the flip side, um, the biblical mandate is that you should hold yourself. Um, uh, you should hold yourself to to the fact of not being sexually active outside of marriage. I cannot go against that biblical mandate or biblical call to say uh, flee immorality, Paul, as Paul has put it. Um, it is difficult, but I do think that uh, sexual wholeness is really the presence of somebody in you. Um, it's interesting. God is called uh, the flame of Yahweh. The Hebrews would call him the flame of Yahweh. And sex is also called the flame of Yahweh. Yahweh being another word name for God. So that flame, really the passions and the desires that you have are something that God gave to you. So if God is invited to preside and to be in you, then you can begin to make some strides in a different path. Um, that's the difficult side of that other side of the question. Uh, I see a comment there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I am now a lost pastor. I thought if God said must be, uh, uh, um, um, I don't know, maybe I'm reading a different translation. No, that's correct. Uh, um, let me read it for you. Um, I'm now lost, pastor. I thought if God said we must be fruitful and multiply, then it must happen. It is not a matter of choice in that case. Otherwise, all the other commandments should only be followed based on one's choice. And there shouldn't be any um, bad consequences for choosing otherwise. Yeah. Um, Genesis 1, 28. I uh, remember earlier as I was teaching, this was pre-fall, uh, where everything was superb and perfect. Um, after the fall, we're dealing with multiple and myriads of conditions. We have people that have had cancer and their cervix was actually their, their, their whole birthing um, organ, organs have been removed or the capacity to have does not even exist anymore. Um, and so if we are reading it that way, we will run into all sorts of problems. Um, the Bible can be read in multiple ways. I, I, that could be another different uh, study altogether. I think maybe um, uh, the, the, the evangelism side uh, could explore this. Um, you can read the Bible as a, as a historical uh, a, a book. Certainly there's traces of what you can do. You can read the Bible, um, sorry, uh, the systematic theology. Systematic theology is scanning through the biblical text and understanding what a theme says. That's what we do about with smoking. The Bible does not come out and says, don't smoke. You will never find a Bible text that says, don't smoke. Drinking, you will find a Bible text that says, drink. You will find a Bible text that says, you are a fool if you drink. There we have problems. So we do systematic theology to scan through the Bible to understand in principle what that, um, um, that, that does. And then there's biblical theology. Biblical theology is getting into the eyes of the writer to see in that particular year, in that time when they were writing that Bible verse, what were they seeing? What were they speaking to? Um, we certainly see that uh, in Paul, where Paul says women must shut up. Uh, <laughs> in church, <laughs> um, that, that, that can be problematic, especially with the nowadays women who are more edu educated than me, who have more to offer than me. How do I tell them to shut up in church? Um, uh, head coverings and all that stuff. Um, so that's, that's one. And the last one is exegesis. Exegesis simply means that I did a little bit of that in my earlier verses, Poinonia. It is going into the words, the Greek, the Aramaic, or the Hebrew, and understanding, is it in the present tense, past tense? What does it mean? Certainly, if you come on Monday, I will delve into the exegesis of forgiveness. With the, we lose a lot of things with forgiveness when we translate it into English. So those are the three ways that you can look at it. So for this particular question, the Bible text does not say must. Um, um, that's eisegesis when we add words into the Bible and we read them into the Bible. Um, uh, it's one of those verses, I don't know where we get them. God helps those who help themselves. 
I dare you to find it, but it's not there. So it's not a, um, a, a, a must. Um, it is what God saw out of love to say, hey, y'all in this union, that's beautiful. Be fruitful and multiply. But after the fall, there's a whole lot of things. So we don't want to leave, let people live in guilt and in shame that they have not followed the biblical mandate. Absolutely. I think it's also key to point out that it says be fruitful. What if people are not fruitful, but you're busy multiplying? Who must take care of all those children now? Uh, so sometimes uh, it could be the reason that we're not yet in a financial position to have kids. And I think people are well within their rights to do that also. Because um, we, we are quick to say multiply, but what about being fruitful? It's important to be fruitful at, as yeah. well. Um, thank you for that. There's another question that says... Uh, why is it that it seems that um, women are more likely to reach orgasm through um, having sex in the morning? So morning glory, um, why not at night? Why is, why is it less likely that they will reach it at night and more likely in the morning? Um, I'm, I'm going to assume certain things in that, in, in that question. And I'm also going to add my own words in that um, not all women um, will have an orgasm in the morning. I think it may be a certain sect that experiences that. Um, and um, quite frankly, I, I don't have a, a straight, full, specific answer. Remember yesterday I confessed and said that I don't know everything. Human bodies are unique and different. This would be one of the cases where I wouldn't know in the morning. I'm gonna make assumptions that you are well rested. When you are well rested, your body is now relaxed. Um, you cannot be having an orgasm when you woke up in the morning, you went to work, and after you come home, you cooked. And after you cooked, you packed the school kids' lunch. And after that, you cleaned. By the time you're lying down, you are, you're, you are exhausted. And then when he comes and says, ah, you know, can we do that thing? He, you are just exhausted. That's when it becomes a buffet. And so the buffet cannot yield an orgasm. I mean, sometimes it starts off as a buffet. Um, and if you're a man and you know how to, to, to work it, uh, um, you may get them to bring the food to the table and it ends up being a three course or four course meal. So um, I would assume that it's probably maybe of relaxation and maybe it's just your body. And I think that's news that you need to tell your, your husband that yo, if you want it, I'll give it up in the morning. And the husband will jump on that. They're like, okay, it's, it's, it's almost guaranteed in the morning. So share that with your husband. And I think that's news that would be gladly welcomed. Absolutely. I'm sure, I'm sure the, the couple would be happy to know that uh, if, if, if the morning works, then let's, let's, let's stick to the morning routine. Um, and I, speaking I of- another I have another question here that I want to jump okay. into. Um, um, by the way, um, as I'm talking, you'll notice that I didn't mention some of the, uh, um, the things that we all already know, um, uh, uh, homosexuality, um, Leviticus uh, 18.22 tells us you shall not, I didn't delve into those supposedly, I assumed, uh, we'll deal with this, that one is always preached up front, and it's used to beat up uh, but I wanted to talk about the unspoken, really the things that we don't really talk about. One of the questions that I have here that was sent in earlier on was the question of um, on intimacy. Um, how to strike a balance between expectations versus reality that is running of household, work, kids, et cetera, from a male and female perspective. Um, so this is talking on the intimacy part. Um, that's, that's really a difficult one because it's loaded with cultural connotations um, because there is a certain expectation that women are supposed to do certain things and men are supposed to do certain things. And I think where you want to begin with is uh, having the conversation with your partner um, as to what you can or cannot do. Um, I am designated in my house. We have uh, we have four four bathrooms and all that stuff, and um, I'm designated as the toilet cleaner in our house. I'm not gonna say whether I do it or do it or don't do it. <laughs> um, uh, I am designated as the guy who vacuums and cleans the basement. 
Um, whether I do it or don't do it, don't ask me that. <laughs> uh, I'm designated as a guy who picks up kids on certain days and all that stuff. Um, so that was that came out of conversation. By all means, I do think that I could certainly do more, but it is realizing that somebody I love, uh, somebody whom I care for, needs the help. Um, it is not first nature for me, it is second nature. I have to be intentional about it. Do I always get it right? Not necessarily. Just yesterday, um, she was about to do the dishes and I say, don't do the dishes. Um, and um, confession, y'all, um, I didn't do the dishes. Uh, the dishes are still waiting for me. <laughs> and I know in her head, she's saying, I was gonna do them last night. You let them sit there. It's overnight now, um, they're not done. Um, I'm going to be going to cook. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I have been called out uh, that it is not help, rightfully so, it is not help. It is my role and responsibility as a husband, as a partner. Yeah, and so I think it's a cultural thing that we need to correct. And she, she's pointing it right that uh, it is not help. Um, it is not help. It is actually a partnership. So I think it's conversations over and over that we need to have and need to help. And certainly it helps with intimacy because if she's not tired, she can get some time to sit. If she's not tired, she can get some time to do other things with you or the family. And it has to be a continuing conversation. I'm learning it. I haven't been many years, married for many years. I, I'm learning it. 10 years now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning it. I haven't figured it out, but have the conversation um, with, your, with, your, with, with, with your husband or your wife, your brother, husband. No, we hear you, we hear because my, my question was about exactly that, that, because uh, in my head, I'm thinking, you know, had you washed those dishes, the amazing <laughs> thing that you would have had. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That was just my thought. Korea, it would have been explosive. Um, because th there's been of arguments on social media where men are saying, this is a myth. There's no such thing that if you are helpful around the house and you're doing all these things, then yeah. you're going to have sex, you know? Because um, also, I think maybe maybe the, the other issue might be the expectation, right? That if I've washed dishes and now I find her sleeping. Like, but... Yeah. But yeah. I did this yeah. so that, and now, yeah. blah, 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 you know. <laughs> so perhaps I think, I think, yeah, I like, I like the the, the the concept of service that we are we are in service to one another. That um, there's a there's a video that's been circulating of Chris Rock where he says, if you're not willing to serve, then you have no business being in a marriage. You know, marriage is about how can I serve you today. So your end goal is not necessarily what am I going to get in return, but how can I serve you? today and even if we go into even the sexual experience with that same thinking that how can I serve you today then there's no way somebody's going to walk out and say no I didn't I wasn't served because we are all mm -hmm. aiming to serve each other and how and, and better it keep and it will keep getting better and better you know it reminds me of a song that says um uh, solid we build it up and build it up and now you know we solid so <laughs> yeah man I think yeah, I really yeah, think yeah. it does get better yeah, I, 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 it's crucial. And I think that's where I would uh, call upon the aunties and the gogos there, that when they are doing the, uh, the, the, the counseling as groups to, to, to deal with the cultural piece. Uh, women are told, you need to go ahead and do this and do this. Uh, for men, we are told something different altogether. So it's correcting, it's a generational correction that needs to be done. Uh, I'm married to a professional woman. Um, she goes out there. Back in the days when I was a pastor, at some point in time, she was making more money than I did. And guess what? I was celebrating that. We put it all in the bank account. We spend it together. Um, I had to deal with my ego of saying I am the breadwinner and so forth. Now roles are different. Uh, the incomes are different. Now I make more. So, But still, having that humility to saying that we're in this together. We are working this together. And, um, and sometimes I find it more when the kids are younger, when the kids are like six months, eight months in a year, and the husband says, I don't know what to do. 
That's a lie from the, from the devil's mouth. <laughs> you can do something. I tried pulling that off. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. There's a, there's another comment here that says, um, in the olden days, roles were well balanced. Men would do the outside work, unlike now, men seem to be having no specific roles in the home. Yet we all now go out to work, like looking after the cattle and all the duties that come with it. So yeah, a lot has changed. Like you're saying, the the gogos need to upgrade the context that they share because um a lot ha has changed. There's another comment that says definitely it's not helping. Yeah, but two people taking responsibilities in making their homes as comfortable as possible. The notion that men are doing their part in helping us for <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's, it's exactly what you what you were saying. That that um things have changed. You know, it, it makes me think even in my approach, my parenting approach with my boys, that I'm not teaching them womanly things or feminine things. I'm teaching them life skills. You need to know how to cook. As much as if I had a daughter, she needs to know how to change a tire. It's a life skill that you need to learn so that you can navigate life. So I think it it, it our, our next generation has a better um. A, a, a better advantage of of or, or a better a better chance rather is what I want to say of navigating because they would have had a different perspective to say I don't expect this from another person because it's a life skill so it's a partnership we're coming together with both the skills to help each other whoever is stronger in that skill they'll be the one who leads out in it and and so on and so forth but I'm I'm grateful for this conversation it has been quite um, enlightening I've learned quite a few things I really appreciate being in a church that speaks about sex in a positive way, um, that speaks about sex in a positive way, that um, empowers women and doesn't make you feel like you should be ashamed for even liking such topics, you know, or even speaking such <clears throat> topics. Because the moment you say, I like to talk about sex, like, oh, you like sex. Oh, what really? a shame. You yeah. know, <laughs> like you should be ashamed of it. You should be ashamed of it. Yet God has given you this, um, a whole huge clitoris that you've explained that it's not even just that would it's a whole bigger um, um, thing. So thank you so much um, to the Family Life Department for the platform to be able to talk about sex in a beautiful way, in a holy way, in a godly way, whereby we are thinking of it as something that is for both of us, something that is going to help us and join us um, in, in, in holy matrimony and empower us and fulfill us and be such a blessing. And that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a state of being. I think that was my take home for tonight, that it's a state of being. I love that um, a lot. Can we please ask sister, I think elder Viwe, to please close for us in prayer? Or maybe you want to close Before you do that, um, before yeah. you do that, um, I just want to quickly run through two questions that came in earlier okay. on because it's related to this. One of the questions that right. came up was, how can SDA families improve sexuality in a busy schedule of, of, I mean, of upcoming professionals? I would just say um, sexuality is not only an SDA problem. 99% um, of the people that I see are non-SDA and they are coming with these problems. Research tells us that women have 30 to 40% of sexual concern issues. Um, so it, the numbers are big and for men. And how you do that is, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier on, plan, 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 um, put on a calendar. Just make sure the calendar is not shared with your in-laws because they'll see sex date and think, oh, okay. So plan, put it on a calendar, prepare for it. That's one thing to do. Um, sex is an integral part of your relationship. It's important just as eating is important. Um, so keep it at the forefront, have conversations around that. The other question was on male and female perspectives on why uh, they cheat. This is uh, the, the last question on why, uh, <clears throat> why uh, 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 men and women cheat. Um, I, 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 there's some, some research done um, Gottman, if you get some time going Google Gottman, it'll tell you a whole lot of things. They did about 40 years of research um, uh, of looking at couples. They would put them in rooms, put cameras, longitudinal studies where they follow couples for 20 years um, and trying to ask them questions, different nationalities, they run different workshops. And so I had my training through the Gottman Institute as a, as a couples counselor. What they discovered about male and female perspectives on why they cheat, they are the same. 
and rarely is it ever about sex. It is more often um, looking for somebody who can give them attention. Uh, for men, sometimes, not for men, for both, sometimes it is coming home and not being attended to and not being heard. And then another person out there gives them an ear and attends to them. And that could be emotionally, which translates to physically, and then it leads to cheating. And so really, it is the absence of your partner, it is the absence of your, of your, of your, of, of your husband or your wife in your life that actually causes cheating. That's the principle at core. Uh, and for some, it is actually even much more dysfunctional, um, such that even though the partner is present for them, they have this urge of actually going out to cheat. That is their trauma response. That's how they learned how to uh, give love. And that's how they learned their manhood. So there are a whole lot of issues that are out there. Uh, more so for women, it has been discovered that it is really looking for a person who's going to be present for them emotionally. And then it translates to more. Briefly, I just wanted to touch on those questions. Um, 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 on the LGBTQ, um, um, here's something that I, I learned the hard way. God does not love you a heterosexual more than he loves a, a, a homosexual person. God does not love you a Sabbath keeping, supper school attending, long dress wearing woman, uh, jacket wearing man more than he loves a person who killed 25 mm. people who is on life in prison. That's the reality of the gospel. And I think we need to keep that at the forefront to say that God loves all. The lifestyle God does not condone. The person God loves. I think I'm going to end it there, Wogolo. Um, for uh, uh, I don't know if I'm frozen or am I still on? Somebody say a thumbs up uh, there. Uh, am I frozen? Okay, I'm good. Okay. All right, it's not me. Okay. Um, uh, the daggers are they there? I guess we may wrap it up here. Um, well, if you give me the platform, I'll keep talking. Masturbation. Uh, while we're trying to figure out what they're going to talk about there, should I? Is well, Polo coming back? I think you can go ahead, Pastor. Uh, you can go ahead. Uh, okay, we're not ready. Okay. Um, masturbation, masturbation, masturbation. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's, <laughs> that's another problem. Man. By now, you're catching on to the fact that uh, my ideas go counterculture, uh, and uh, they may be problematic to uh, too many. The Bible talks about masturbation. Um, in fact, it doesn't even talk about masturbation. We use a biblical text in Genesis chapter 38. Um, I think it's verse uh, 9 and 10, the story of Onan, where Onan did not want to have children. Um, and God struck him and he died. And we go into that text and we use that as a biblical text of um, talking about the fact that we... Um, uh, sorry, I was reading a message here. Um, um, losing my chain of thought. Um, yeah, so we've used that text as a text to um, uh, explain and to bounce and to condemn uh, masturbation. Uh, that text is not even talking about masturbation. The reason why God struck Onan it was because Onan was going against the Levrite marriage. Levrite marriage, um, uh, Levrite marriage 
I think it's common in, in, in many of the cultures. If the oldest brother dies, the next brother comes in into the, into, into the marriage bed, takes on the brother's wife in order to continue the marriage uh, and to continue the lineage by having children so that they can have the, the last name <clears throat> the last name of the family. So when really Onan was struck dead, it was about that. It was not necessarily that he masturbated. He actually pulled out and spilled. Is Pastor Moyo frozen or is it is it just me? Yeah, I think we have lost him there. Okay. Uh, I've been asked uh, by the Ntakas to to offer a word of, of prayer. We lost uh, both our host and our presenter now. Um, I don't know if I'm, um, I'm able to switch on my video. Yeah, I guess I can do that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I guess we'll pass on the message to our amazing presenter, Pastor Moyo, and Buholo, our host, uh, who have uh, dropped out. But now what I'm going to do is uh, offer the closing prayer. Uh, I think we can start perhaps with uh, the next time we have uh, Pastor Moyo. He can um, take some of the questions or provide his closing remarks. But for now, I'm going to ask that uh, we, we pray. And I think it was a very good and very eye-opening session. Oh, there's Pastor Moyo. Pastor Moyo, I'm Viwe Mchonchi, and I've been asked to just step in for our amazing host, uh, because I think her electricity tripped. Let me allow you to complete with your closing remarks and then I'll offer the closing prayer. Over to you, sir. Uh, Viu, I'm not sure how far I had gone. I had started talking about masturbation and my, I think my Wi-Fi turned down. Um, but I think maybe when, we can... The, the, the last part we had was when you were talking about what Onan had done and how that has been used to say uh this is the argument against so that's when we lost uh, okay okay yeah um so um uh i'm not gonna give necessarily a yeah nay but one principles um that way you may go ahead and use them uh as bible students and study it and split it a little more i know for a Uh, people are asked to give a definitive answer. So receiving and giving love, the image of God, um, it is about reciprocity with your partner. And more often what happens with masturbation is there is an additional aid that is used towards that self-pleasure. And that additional aid may be the viewing of pornography. It may be the fantasizing of a somebody who is not your spouse, um, certainly that can be problematic because the image of God is love. It is the reciprocity giving and receiving um, of, of, of love. And so that's one thing that you need to keep at as the principle there. And in, in, the, in light of time, uh, maybe we'll touch on a little bit more, but um, you can work that principle as you see fit. And um, certainly I invite questions around that. Over to you, Vio. I think uh, we can end it here. It's been long enough. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Kingsley. This was this was beautiful. Um, it's interesting that on our YouTube channel, uh, it looks like, I don't know if it's a stripping club, I kept making the comments and was trying to close. So which means this very important topic, as you had indicated, 
is being uh, sabotaged by by the enemy. Now, the reason now I have my my um, camera off it's because I'm, I'm thinking that maybe the the, the bandwidth is uh, is struggling. So I uh, would like to really thank you. Uh, this was I had written in one of the comments that this is one of the best presentations I've ever had having you know, this topic presented uh, in such a beautiful and in the context of uh, it as a gift and about God's love, the gift from God. So really, I mean, with me, I'm a single person. So it's interesting because it's, and it's married people have been speaking and you spoke so beautifully about the argument why we should uh, wait until we're in the context of marriage. And that was very well explained. Thank you, thank you very much. So I'm going to offer the closing prayer now. Um, our kind and loving Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for giving us, Lord, uh, this very timely message in this generation. We want to thank you, Lord, um, for Pastor Moyo, how, Lord, he has explained uh, using your word and that, Father, Indeed, you have come that we might have life in abundance in all facets of our lives. Even, Lord, some of the scriptures, as you talk about um, the church being your bride and have become very clear just, Lord, from this presentation. So our prayer, Lord, that indeed that marriages may be places of love, places of pleasure, places of peace, uh, because, Father, you're at the center and the reason, Lord, you had created us was for us to really worship you in spirit and in truth. We're praying, Lord, even for those who are single, uh, that, Lord, as we embrace uh, the, the season of being single, uh, whether, Lord, it, it would be for, for a while or for a short time, that, Lord, we may know that you are with us when you um, give us um, those times. It means you are also able to enable us to be able to live as single people in and in purity. Thank you so much, Lord. We pray that uh, Pastor Kingsley may also continue to flourish as he teaches the best way to approach uh, this life. Um, we are praying, Lord, that as a church, as those who are listening currently live, and those, Lords who are going to continue to listen uh, via the YouTube and the Facebook channel, that all of us, Lord, may continue to learn and grow. We are praying, Lord, now that as we meet again tomorrow, from this uh, family week of prayer, we may never be the same after this. Thank you for answering our prayer, for we pray in the beautiful and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.